our first presentation today is about something that really excites me. You know, I've been working with Janon for a number of years, actually going back to about 2007. And I've learned so much about nutrition and health. And I've also discovered the key values of yogurt. You know, Sean, I was just thinking one of these days, we must actually have somebody come in and chat to us specifically about yogurt as a snack because I know it's something that's very important, should be part of your diet. But anyway, I digress. Uh, this week is National Nutrition and National Obesity Week, and we have an acclaimed dietitian, Lila Brook, to chat to us. She has a stream of qualifications behind her name, and she chats on radio and television. So I'm not going to chat much more about it. So Layla, Lila, I'm going to hand over to you and you introduce your topic and chat about nutrition at youth level and also to talk about how our coaches can actually help develop their own players and help them develop a healthier lifestyle. So it's over to you. Thank you so much for that and good morning everybody. It's so lovely to be with you all today. I'm just showing you my camera right so you can see me. Um, so I'm very, very passionate about this topic, um, about sports nutrition in general, um, but specifically in relation to the children and the youth of South Africa and anywhere else in the world that you might be watching. Um, and so I do think it's a very, very exciting topic and a very, very topical topic, especially since we have a situation at the moment where Obviously, the effects of COVID have hit us all in various ways, and sport is no different. So I'm just going to do a screen share so that I can share the presentation. Okay. So um, just to go through what we'll basically be covering in the talk. Firstly, looking at what is good nutrition. Secondly, National Nutrition Week, which is happening at the moment. The importance of good nutrition for our youth. Our specific nutritional challenges in South Africa the importance of exercise, benefits of school sport, snacking, nutrition before training and events, the effect of lockdown on family nutrition, eating healthily on a budget, signs of poor nutrition in sport, and also some practical ways to improve nutrition and sport. So looking firstly at what is good nutrition, um, essentially when we speak about good nutrition or balanced nutrition, we're looking at a balance of all the various food groups, all the various nutrients within those specific food groups. And to make sure that someone is getting really the full variety of foods they need, which obviously then optimizes health. So if you have a look at this image, ideally half a person's plate should be vegetables. So this is all salads, stir fry, cooked vegetables, raw soups, etc., all fall into the vegetables and half a plate ideally should be vegetables. Then you'll see that a quarter of the plate should be protein. So that's all your animal proteins, meat, chicken, fish, eggs, dairy, but also your legumes as well. So beans, lentils, chickpeas, all of those are sources of protein. And a quarter of the plate should be protein. The protein has not only the role of um, helping with muscle growth and recovery, which you're all familiar with, but essentially, most, the protein is really the building block of virtually every single component within the body. So whether it is the hormones, enzymes, um, organs, muscles, tissues, etc., everything needs protein to be built. So it's essential from that point of view. And then the last quarter of the plate should be made up of carbohydrates. So that's all the pasta, rice, potatoes, bread, cereal, etc. Um, and the main, the main a function of the carbohydrates is really for energy. And that's why I'm always very hesitant with any athletes following a very low carb diet, because really those carbohydrates are so necessary from the point of view of energy levels, from the point of view of making sure that there's enough energy to train as well as to recover as well. And in fact, one of the main forms of sort of exhaustion or the effect of overtraining is actually due to not enough carbohydrate intake. So certainly carbohydrates are something that are extremely important. Then looking at National Nutrition and Obesity Week, because um, that is where we are at the moment, as you can see the date, the date is the 9th to the 19th of October. Um, and essentially what National Nutrition and Obesity Week is, is that every year there is a different theme that's chosen 
for this um, week. Actually, to be honest, it's 10 days, but we'll pretend it's a week. <laughs> and uh, it used to be a week, they've extended it. So we've had various themes in the past, focusing more, say, on um, health and nutrition in children, focusing more on um, specifically weight, healthy lunchboxes. We've had various topics over the years. But this year, which is obviously very pertinent, is we're looking at specifically good nutrition for good immunity. And essentially what that means is to help the public to understand better what it actually means to eat correctly to boost your immunity, to maintain your immunity for optimal health, but to not only prevent disease, but to recover from disease as well. And certainly the focus is, as you can see from one of these um, sort of flyers that were created, for um, this National Nutrition Week. Um, the focus is also to make sure that people realize that healthy food is affordable. And this is something I'll speak about a bit more later, but there's generally this misconception that eating healthy is expensive, which it isn't. It really does depend on how you, um, what you choose to eat, how you manage it, how you really um, sort of uh, address your food choices in relation to what is actually the best option for you and your family, but obviously it fits into your budget. And you can have a look, you can see the link at the bottom here. Um, now it's Nutrition Week to see the day, and you can click on that, um, or I can't click on it from here, obviously, but you can go to the website and you can have a look and find out more information about um, Nutrition Week this year. So that's definitely very, very um, topical. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that so many people um, in South Africa struggle with um, poor immunity for whatever reason as a result of poor nutrition. And um, especially a big one is vitamin A. So what's very interesting is in the Eastern Cape, they had a very, very high rate of um, vitamin A deficiency in children. And um, vitamin A is extremely important for immunity and keeping the body's linings in place. So like gut lining, skin, et cetera. And if that isn't in place, then they should, um, they, they, there's a good chance that um, the person will have a poor immunity because there's a greater chance that various sort of bacteria and viruses can sort of get through the gut and therefore into the bloodstream. So um, obviously vitamin A is very important from that point of view. So what is very, very um, interesting is that in the Eastern Cave, what they did to combat this vitamin A deficiency is they started growing um, those orange sweet potatoes. You know, you get more of the lighter yellow ones and then you actually have purple ones too. Um, and then you get the more bright, bright orange sweet potatoes. And um, they started growing those and making sure that the children were getting those bright orange sweet potatoes. And that has actually reduced the incidence of vitamin A, to a vitamin A deficiency dramatically. So um, generally, the brighter orange um, fruits and vegetables are higher in vitamin A or beta carotene, which is the one version of it. And yeah, these bright orange sweet potatoes really helped with that. And once again, it's an affordable food. It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be something that's complicated or weird or that you have to get from a pharmacy. But really, everyday good food and healthy food can be something that can really have a significant benefit on overall immunity and health as well. So that is our theme for this year. So looking at specifically good nutrition for the youth, um, what we really are looking at is, as I said, immunity, but overall growth and health is important. So obviously, if a child isn't eating correctly, chances are their growth is going to be affected. And we generally see poor growth happening from malnutrition in two different ways. We get underweight, obviously, but also we get stunting. So what tends to happen is that if, some, if a child does not get enough to eat when they're small um, or young, then obviously they are going to likely to be underweight, that goes without saying, but that potentially can be corrected when they eat more. However, stunting would be a situation where they don't reach their full height because they actually um, have such a severe malnutrition, which can't really be corrected but beyond a certain point. Um, you know, once they've reached um, 18 in the case of women and 21 in the case of men, they have reached their adult height and there's only so much that one can do by improving nutrition. So it's so important to make sure that from the point of view of um, sort of optimizing growth and allowing the child to reach their full height potential that that is managed. And this is obviously particularly important if we're thinking about sport where height is an advantage, say something like basketball. So we want to obviously optimize growth um, in, in all spheres 
but yeah, that is something that's very important. And similarly, concentration. So if a child doesn't eat correctly, they can't concentrate in school, they can't reach their optimal potential from an academic point of view. And that is very, very important to, um, to bear in mind and to manage. Um, and then also future health, of course. So I always like the concept of future proofing, that eating correctly and good nutrition can really help to optimize not only one's health now, but one's health down the line. And certainly if a child has poorer um, nutritional intake when they're younger, they will be at higher risk of various diseases later, osteoporosis, diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's even down the line. So it's very important for a child to eat correctly from that point of view. But even so, if we think about the fact that if a child grows up in an environment where they learn to eat healthily, they learn that good nutrition is part of everyday life and is something that should be prioritized, then they already are set up for the future in terms of knowing what healthy food is and how to eat correctly and how to eat healthily. So it's such a huge advantage in terms of really teaching children young what it means to eat healthily, to eat vegetables, to know how to prepare, prepare foods, to get used to foods that aren't oily or greasy or deep fried. And if we can teach that at a young age, we really are setting our children up for future health success. So looking specifically at the nutritional challenges in South Africa, and to be honest, I wouldn't say this is unique to South Africa, but really any developing country, um, we have in South Africa what is called the double burden of malnutrition, which is essentially that we see incidences of both undernutrition and overnutrition. So undernutrition would be obviously not eating enough food, and as a result specifically what that means is that um, often not only children, adults as well, would be very much underweight, would be essentially starving, would be um, really, really um, at a very low weight. However, we also have overnutrition, where we have a situation where a large, large proportion of our population are overweight. In fact, we have a situation where um, it's approximately 50% of um, people in South Africa are overweight. And specifically um, with women, it's close to two thirds of women in South Africa are overweight, which is obviously a very, very scary percentage. So um, definitely is something that we need to think about that when we are addressing nutrition issues, issues in South Africa, it's not just about, oh, well, you need to manage your weight. What does that actually mean? Because similar to that, we also have what's called hidden malnutrition, which is that although someone might look to be a healthy weight, they're not getting the vitamins and minerals they need, which in turn means that they are um, malnourished in a different way. So they might have enough protein and carbohydrates to and fats to be at a healthy weight, to not be overweight, to not be underweight. But the micronutrients, as they're called, the vitamins and minerals that they need, they're not getting enough to really maintain the health where it should be, which then in turn puts them at risk of immunity issues and also puts them at risk of not being able to be sort of at an optimal health in all ways. So, so important to really um, address all elements of uh, malnutrition when one thinks about nutrition in South Africa. It's not just about you need to eat more. It's really about what, is const what constitutes healthy eating and how to really optimize that as well. Um, then household food insecurity is a big issue in South Africa. That essentially means that there, isn't, there are many, many households in South Africa where having enough food is not a guarantee. That, they, that people are not certain as to where their next meal is coming from. They're often many, if not all the people in the household are unemployed. And there's just a difficulty in simply being able to put food on the table. And the issue with this is obviously that, as I'll speak to, I'll speak about a little bit more later, that this has been completely increased even more so during this COVID time. So obviously it's something that needs to be addressed from that point of view. Um, education is a big one, which I just mentioned a little earlier, that it's not only about having enough money to buy enough foods, but also having the knowledge to know what is the right choice, to, what are the right choices. And um, when it comes to food education and nutrition education, what is so key is to think about how do we get the message across to the public? How do we make people aware of the right choices so that they feel empowered to be able to know this is this is a good choice for me and my family. This food will give me this benefit and this is what I need to optimize my health. And that's why basically the main reason why we do National Nutrition Week, to give a dedicated time every year to educate the public better about what is good nutrition and 
how to make them make, them, make them feel more comfortable making their own choices. So something that I think that definitely needs to be done more on a public health level is really educating on good nutrition more. I think there's a lot of emphasis placed on food hygiene, especially at the moment, washing hands, obviously, but uh, preparing food safely and um, making sure that food is stored in a way that's safe to prevent um, any foodborne illnesses, but really teaching people the fundamental of um, good nutrition in a way that is accessible, I don't think is done enough. And that's something which I wish was done more. <laughs> um, then food culture is an interesting one because, you know, you can have all the education you want and some can have the financial finances they need to be able to buy the food that you've mentioned. But a lot of it is that in every country, they have their own food culture. Like if you look at America, for example, their food culture is very much large portions focus on fast food. I mean, obviously, this is a generalization. I understand it's not like this everywhere in America, but there is that general sort of um, feeling in the States that that's the focus. Um, and yeah, I mean, easily a normal sized um, dinner portion at a restaurant could be shared between four people comfortably, their portions are that big. So their culture is very much based on big portions, not necessarily healthy foods. Our culture in South Africa, we obviously have a lot of focus on brine, which can be done healthily, but the problem is that burnt red meat is very much carcinogenic, the little bits on the burnt meat, and that's something that you don't want to do too often. Um, so the brine is an issue. We also generally, um, you know, there's like all cultures, there's a focus on food, being a part of celebration, which isn't problematic, but it's also teaching people where celebrations come in, in terms of good food choices that obviously, yes, a special occasion to so have cake, but that doesn't mean that every day is a special occasion. <laughs> okay, then looking at the effect specifically of lockdown on family nutrition. So obviously, as I mentioned, there's the financial implications. There's been a huge number of job losses around the world, but especially in South Africa as well. Um, I read some statistic that something like 250,000 domestic workers have lost their job during this COVID time, which is a crazy number. Um, so yeah, the financial implications are huge. And um, obviously job losses means poorer household food security. Emotional eating is a big one. I've seen this a lot in my practice that there's been a huge increase in emotional eating and managing emotional eating as well from that point of view. Um, a lot of people have found that they've struggled to eat healthily as well as to make sure that they um, feel comfortable with their food choices from that point of view. Um, and a lot of people have found that they have eaten more of those foods they wouldn't usually have. They've eaten more out of stress, they've eaten more out of anxiety, and they've eaten more out of boredom as well. Um, I think for a lot of people, eating has become an activity or a hobby. So um, <laughs> I think that a lot of people can probably attest to that. And then coupled with that, a decrease in physical activity, you know, during that initial phase of lockdown where you couldn't even walk outside. Certainly, that is something that would affect your um, physical activity levels. And um, I've also found a lot of my clients who have been very much reliant on going to the gym for the activity rather than, say, walking or running or whatever it may be outside. A lot of those people, even though gyms have reopened, have either not felt, felt comfortable going back to the gym or have felt that they are um, kind of almost have to kind of get back into that routine, which is a little bit of a difficulty and a slog to achieve. So certainly what I think is um, something that, I'm sure that all the coaches have found is that now to try and get people re-motivated when it comes to exercise and training is, is a challenge. Availability of food, and by that I don't necessarily only mean household food security, but also that um, a lot of people are anxious about going to the shops, um, especially, I mean, I think people are probably less anxious now, but especially during those initial phases, people were. Um, and that means that often they were kind of shopping less frequently and maybe kind of not always making best choices or kind of not have, having less fresh vegetables. I've heard of people doing that because simply like they weren't getting to shops as often to buy the fresh vegetables and they don't want to buy in bulk because they don't want it to go off. So yeah, it's had a huge impact. I've seen so many people who've gained very large amounts of weight during this lockdown period. I have a client who gained about 20 kilos during the first four months. So yeah, it's, it's very much the case that it's quite problematic. 
Um, then eating healthily on a budget, as I mentioned earlier, there is this idea that to eat healthily, you have to spend a lot. And that isn't the case. There are certainly ways to eat healthily on a budget that makes it not expensive, that makes it practical, and that is very sort of straightforward for most people. So the first thing is to always choose seasonal fruits and vegetables. So generally those, um, you know, those imported nectarines from Spain, <laughs> they're going to be expensive and that's because they're not in season. So when you choose the seasonal fruits and vegetables, generally those ones that are on special, to be honest, you can be assured that you'll have a situation where it'll be cheaper and you'll be getting a better deal. Similarly, also using legumes is a great way to have a more budget friendly meal. So, um, legumes being all your lentils, chickpeas, beans, those are very cost effective. They help to extend other proteins. For example, if you add lentils to um, your spaghetti bolognese mince, it will um, make you feel like you have, have more mince than you, than you do, but um, it also adds fiber as well. So it actually overall makes your spaghetti bolognese more nutritious meal. And it's very versatile. Um, you can add chickpeas to a salad. You can add um, baked beans to, I don't know, to toast and now you want a meal. It doesn't have to be something that's super complicated at all. You don't have to use dried legumes. The tins are fine. Um, obviously, it's more convenient and it's something you can always sort of keep available. But yeah, the cost effectiveness and is um, a huge advantage. And legumes are also, as I said, high in proteins. They also have uh, quite high in carbohydrates as well and high in fiber, high in B vitamins. So really a great option. And herbs and spices are also a good one because they're generally a cost-effective way to add flavor to a food on a, with lower cost. Frozen fish is great, just as nutritious as fresh, more convenient and also cheaper as well. Um, and you just got to make sure always to defrost the fish before cooking, otherwise it is very extra fishy. Um, Home-cooked meals should always be the first choice. A lot of people, I think, rely on takeaways. Um, restaurant and restaurant food in general, but certainly if you cook it yourself, it is much cheaper and you also have the added advantage that you can actually control what goes into the food so you can make sure that you're making a healthier option. Then looking at frozen vegetables. So, oops, sorry. Um, so frozen, oops, no, 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 no. so frozen vegetables um, are just as nutritious as fresh. The thing that must be remembered when it comes to frozen vegetables is that they are um, generally frozen after a slight cooking process. So they are basically blanched in hot water and then frozen. So when you defrost the vegetables, they've already been partially cooked. You don't need to boil them to death. You literally just let them defrost and then warm them up. They don't actually need more cooking than that. Um, bulk buying is always useful if you have place to store it and if it won't go off. So there's no point in bulk buying a box of apples if it's just one person, because the apples will obviously just go rotten. But say bulk buying a whole lot of chicken breasts that, and assuming you have the freezer space to store it and it works out cheaper, great. And similarly, you can also bulk prepare and then freeze the individual portions of meals um, based on what you've made. Okay, then looking at the importance of exercise in general, I mean, obviously, I know you all are in the business, so it's not like I need to convince you of anything extra. <laughs> but um, firstly, looking at weight management, obviously, exercise helps significantly to manage weight, fitness. Also, obviously, mental health is a big one that if you exercise regularly, it definitely does improve mental health. It's a natural antidepressant. It also helps to lower stress and improve focus as well. So generally, if someone exercises regularly, they generally feel lower levels of stress and sort of better able to concentrate in their work or school. Um, and physical health, obviously. So exercise has been found to lower the risk of hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, dementia. Um, virtually every single disease <laughs> is helped by increasing physical activity. So, um, or it's prevented by that. So so important from that point of view and then looking at obviously the benefits of school sports because that's one of our main concern concerns there are so many benefits but a big one is teamwork and teaching a child how to work in a team how to be part of a team how to really interact with someone in a way that's respectful and that optimizes everyone else's sort of performance especially if they're in a sort of a captain position is 
hugely important. And that also comes into my next point there in terms of a sense of responsibility, that they learn, okay, well, if I don't arrive at my soccer game, then I'm basically letting down the whole team. Interestingly, from an academics point of view, it has been found that academics is so, um, so much more of a positive result if someone is part of school sports. So in other words, that, and that comes out as the next thing, which is problem solving skills, that very often children who are involved regularly in school sports are able to solve problems better are, and have actually better academic performance. And the last one there is in terms of boosting self-esteem. So if someone is able to boost their self-esteem, sorry, if someone's able to exercise, it helps to boost their self-esteem because they actually learn to overcome challenges and to learn, oh, well, yesterday I could only run this number of 100 meters. Now I can run longer. Now my time has improved and it gives a sense of, a sense of achievement, a sense of improvement, etc. So looking at snacking, snacking is very, very important because I think firstly, it often has a negative connotation. Snacking often people relate to um, bad food choices and uncontrollable eating. And actually, it really isn't about that at all. In fact, when it comes to snacking, it can really be an opportunity to improve nutritional intake. And that's really what needs to be thought when it comes to snacking. So it's an opportunity to get more protein in, more vegetables. Um, it doesn't have to be a time to just eat chips. So it does obviously need to be regulated to manage calorie intake, but it still can be a very important part of the process. Ideally, snacks should be spaced about every two and a half to four hours. And that basically means that, for example, if breakfast is at seven, the next meal or snack would be between 9, 30 and 11. Then if a snack was had at 10 a.m., then the next meal or snack would be between 12, 30 and two. So that that way there's not too long between meals, but also not too short. Also, the snack should ideally have a balance of protein, carbs, fat, and fruits or vegetables as well. So some examples of snacks include yogurt, fresh fruit, dried fruit, sports bars or energy bars or health bars. Those just obviously choosing the right ones because they are a huge variety and not all are as good as others. Um, health bread or seed loaf, whole wheat crackers like provitas with yellow cheese or loaf of cottage cheese or avo or peanut butter. And meal replacement shakes as well also have a place. Um, I'm not keen to recommend meal replacement shakes in general or as a first choice. It should always be after other options are explored. But I do definitely think that they have a place and can be very useful from that point. Looking at nutrition before training and events. So one of the main functions of um, pre-event or pre-event, pre-training nutrition is to really top up liver glycogen stores. So your liver stores glycogen, which is the storage form of glucose. And it's a bigger store of glycogen in the body, or it's the only store of glycogen in the body rather, and the biggest store of glucose in the body. So generally, assuming that one's liver glycogen stores are topped up well and are very much replete, then generally the glycogen stores will provide enough glucose for an exercise or training session or event that lasts sort of one and a half to two hours. Beyond that, the athlete would need to actually then top up their glucose during the event. So if they're doing, for example, something like comrades, for example, then they will need to make sure that they have a lot more um, than whatever, they, whatever they've eaten before the event. They'll need to make sure they're careful during the event as well. Um, hydration is important and very often pre-training events can actually help with hydration depending what's chosen. And also it's very, very important that the, that the pre-event meals or snacks are easy to digest, so generally lower in fiber. Also something that the athlete has tested out before. It shouldn't be that the first time that they try a specific food is on the day. It should be something that they've tried before. Um, and something that gives them a bit of a psychological or mental boost as well on that point. So something that they feel um, comfortable with, that they really enjoy, not something that they find weird, um, it really should be that that pre-event meal is something that has a positive effect, um, not only nutritionally, but emotionally and mentally as well. So looking at some pre-competition main meals, firstly, um, so like a spaghetti or pasta-based meal with meat or vegetable tomato-based topping is a good option. Grilled chicken breast also with mashed potato, sweet potato or stir-fried rice. Baked potato with tuna, chicken or a vegetable-based topping. Um, extra bread, fruit, fruit salad, and low-fat yogurt. Um, also, 
having a top up snack before the event. So it might be a necessity. So depending on what's chosen, it, it is very much a, um, a, a need or a necessity in some cases to have a snack before. So if, for example, someone is having their pre event meal like four hours before a the event, then they might need to have a smaller snack just before. So that's just something to bear in mind. Okay. Um, then in terms of pre-competition snacks, so this would be directly before, and this is where the top-up snack comes in. So this would be something like a sandwich, maybe fresh fruit or yogurt, um, and or a smoothie as well can work. Also, um, sports bars or cereal bars and sports drinks also can be something that can be included. A low fiber breakfast cereal, like cornflakes or rice krispies, a low fat milk or yogurt, because once again, we don't want too much fiber before a competition. Um, liquid meal replacement shakes, if there's no appetite, can be an option. As I said, I don't love them in every case, and especially for younger children, I wouldn't necessarily recommend them. But also we have to recognize that many athletes before an event feel quite anxious nervous and um, might have a loss of appetite as a result. The recovery snacks, this would be after the event or after the training. And to be honest, if it's a very, very light workout, I mean, if it's something like stretching, then it wouldn't be necessary. But if it's an event that's a good sort of hour or more, then a recovery snack would be necessary, especially if it was a very intense hour. And basically for every hour that the athlete is trained, they need one to two recovery snacks. So um, also that uh, it will obviously depend on what is happening in terms of whether they're say, busy with a tournament or whether it's just a training session, and that will affect the extent to which um, they have to, how many recovery snacks they need. So the recovery snacks, you've got their um, various options. So a sports specific recovery formula. On that point, I wouldn't recommend um, specific sports drinks or sports or protein shakes or anything like that to anyone under the age of 16. Obviously, you do get meal replacement shakes, things like Pediasure for children who are up to the age of 10. And there's also Insha similarly for, um, for say, teenagers who are under the age of 16. But um, when it comes to an actual protein shake or anything like that, I, I wouldn't recommend it to a 15, 14-year-old at all. Um, so when I'm talking about those recovery formulas, I'm talking about those people over the age of 16. Also, an energy drink and a liquid meal supplement can also work a fruit smoothie or a milkshake, obviously not a milkshake made with like tons of um, sugar, because we don't want that either, but getting the right sort of balance in terms of that is important. Um, a fruit yogurt or a drinking yogurt also is useful. Drinking yogurt and an energy bar, a small handful of biltong and an energy bar or dried fruit bars. So you have those little bars that are just dried fruit. Um, two sports bars that give about 50 grams of carbohydrates and 10 to 20 grams of protein. A sandwich once again, cereal, bultong and an energy drink, uh, bultong and jelly babies even, so it gives you the carbs and the protein. And um, also something like rice cakes and bultong as well could work. So the thing is that the recovery snacks always should have a balance of protein and carbohydrates. That's basically their purpose. So there should be virtually equal amounts of protein to carbohydrates. And ideally those recovery snacks should be had within about the first 30 minutes of, of finishing the training or the event. However, having said that as well, um, when it comes to the, um, the recovery process, it's not, we're not just looking actually at that first half an hour afterwards, but even up to four hours, it's important to make sure that recovery is taken into account. So ideally four hours after the training session, um, the athlete would need to have a meal that contains about four parts carbohydrate to one part protein. So like for example, a whole lot of pasta with a little bit of bolognese sauce, basically, for example. So that's how that recovery process should work. And also fluid is obviously important. So to make sure that they're drinking enough. So what an athlete can do is weigh themselves before and after a training event and whatever they've lost is how much fluid they need. So every kilo they lose is another liter of fluid that they need to include. So signs of poor nutrition in sports, and this might be um, something that you've seen with those that you've coached. So um, a poor recovery is a big one that if you don't eat correctly, and as you can see from those recovery snacks, if you don't address specifically post-event or post-training nutrition, that can really affect your recovery rate. Um, low energy, obviously struggling to actually move across the fields, um, similar to that next point fatigue, often is related to not eating correctly. 
Low mood and depression is strongly related to poor nutrition and also can be a sign of overnutrition in itself, uh, over training in itself. Um, so that is key. Poor progress, so not progressing at the rate that one would expect for the amount of training they're doing. Um, and then also actually comes down to poor recovery as well, that if they're not recovering correctly. Low muscle mass and increased body fat mass, both of those can be related also to eating correctly and not getting the correct balance in terms of what they've been doing. Okay, so some practical ways to improve nutrition in sport. So I've got a whole lot of options here in terms of increasing fruits and vegetable intake. So adding fruit to cereals, having a smoothie, um, having fruit as a quick and convenient snack between meals, snacking on um, vegetables that you can use a dip, say a pumice, cottage cheese, avo, etc. Including vegetables and stir fry, soup, salads, stews, and vegetable juices. Putting salad onto a sandwich just to increase the fiber of the sandwich and make it more filling. And also trying out new and exotic fruits and vegetables when they're available. Obviously still in season though, because that can help to so, um, make fruit and vegetable intake more interesting and add more um, variety. Also what helps a lot is meal prepping. So making sure that, they're, um, that when it comes to meals, to try and prepare in advance as far as possible. So to try to, for example, make the meals for the next few days in advance and either freeze them or put them in the fridge <clears throat> in individual containers so that it's very, very easy to just quickly grab a container and go. And that's also where convenience comes in as well. To really try to make things as simple and convenient for oneself by trying to really um, choose foods that are accessible, not to try and get foods that are a mission to, to try to procure, but rather really choosing those foods that are easily available in the area where the person lives and that they find it easy to prepare and easy to eat as well. So that that's, doesn't need sort of to be peeled overly or et cetera. Um, I'm thinking about, I don't know why I'm thinking about like um, something like artichokes, which require huge amounts of preparation and that I just always feel is a very inconvenient food. So yeah, just as a convenience. Um, so smoothies, I'm not like, although I've mentioned smoothies a couple of times, I'm not a huge fan of smoothies from a weight point of view, because I feel that it's very, very easy to have a huge number of calories in that one little smoothie. So I'm not keen from that point of view, but sometimes it can be a very useful way to improve nutrition and get a better balance of um, the various food groups by say throwing some spinach into that smoothie and now you've got more of a vegetable intake. Leftovers, always to optimize leftovers to really use them to make life easier for the next day um, and to use them when you can and also including different cooking methods to add variety to prepare foods in different ways are very useful. And then also timing of treats is a big one. That doesn't mean necessarily that you need to, when it comes to treats that, that an athlete, or if we look specifically at a child, that they can never have treats. I think that um, it should be, okay, well, it's always dessert on a certain day. It's always dessert on a Saturday, but also random time during the week, we can have a treat. It doesn't have to be that it's always only defined at a certain time, but it's important that treats are almost demystified by being sort of part of every sort of day situation. It doesn't need to be a case that it's um, only um, at certain days or not allowed at all. I don't think that helps and that often backfires as well. Okay, so um, that's it from me. Does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? Any thoughts, anything that they'd like to inquire from that point of view? You're, um, you're muted, Cassie. Lala, <laughs> yeah. Lala, that really is food for thought, excuse the pun. That was actually very, very interesting. I mean, you gave us a Good. lot of input. What I found very interesting was your tinned food. So the tinned food you say is still very nutritious because there's a stigma to tin food. They say it's not nearly as good as fresh fruit. Is that not the case? So certainly when it comes to tin food, especially if you talk about tin vegetables, um, definitely tin food, should I take the stop sharing on? Um, so when it comes to tin food, certainly what like does tend to happen is that it has a higher sodium content. So like for example, tinned, uh, I don't know, tin carrots will have more sodium than frozen or more salt than frozen carrots or, fro or fresh carrots. 
But if we look at the convenience, then that's a huge impact. And you're still getting the fiber or those nutritional value be slightly affected. But if we talk about legumes specifically, which have so many health benefits, if we have tinned, it's a much easier, more convenient way to add them than the process of making them when they're dried, where you have to soak them for like ever and, um, and then still cook them and then try to then add them to your food. So specifically legumes, I think, are very, makes the most sense to have tinned. You can rinse them afterwards <laughs> to get rid of some of the extra salt, which just helps. Sorry, you're going to say. And I also find it very interesting, this double burden of malnutrition, because a lot of people do mm. say, they say, yeah. why do you say we've got nutrition, but yet we've, the, 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 we've got the highest obesity in the world? Yeah, so can you, not in can the world. A, but yes. Y- yes. Can you be obese and still have malnutrition? Talk about you can. fortified, th- th- these fortifieds, for example, the, the, the pup that we eat. Uh, I know yeah. a lot of it is fortified. Just tell us more yes. about that. Yes. So that's correct. So many foods are fortified. Um, so I, I, would, I wouldn't actually say all pup is, um, but certainly you do get a lot of foods that are fortified with B vitamins um, and that would have that sort of extra benefit. But yeah, I mean, definitely it is possible that someone can be overweight, say from consuming very large amounts of, you mentioned pup, but so say starch in general, but they're missing out on protein. Do you know what I mean? So that can still be the case. It's not a given that um, necessarily that you can have a large amount of calories and still get the vitamins and minerals that you need. So certainly obesity and malnutrition can happen concurrently. And your talk on vitamin A and the lining of the stomach, that was extremely interesting. So we've had a question. Uh, Give us some more examples of vitamin A foods. So no, in terms of vitamin, vit- yes. Sorry. Mm-hmm, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. We always think of vitamin A as only good for the eyes, but I mean, you gave us a completely different view of what vitamin A yeah. is so important for. So vitamin A, the precursor of vitamin A is beta carotene, which is um, basically the more um, readily available form of vitamin A. It then has to be converted to vitamin A in the body. So beta carotene, as I mentioned earlier, all your sort of dark, bright orange fruits and vegetables are high in beta carotene. Carrots, pumpkin, butternut, cling peaches, mango. Um, what else is it? I'm sure there's another one I'm forgetting, but yeah, all the bright orange ones. But then in addition to that, your dark green ones also are high in beta carotene. So like, for example, spinach and broccoli. Um, so that, that orange pigment is a beta carotene. In fact, as I can attest to, um, if you have too many carrots, your palms will go orange. I had that happen to me at Varsity. Uh, so, <laughs> um, basically, you know, those be- baby carrots are so convenient. So I used to have a lot of those. Anyway, so it's not dangerous. It's not like it's a problem to have a large amount of beta carotene, but sometimes does cause that um, sort of orangeness of the palms. But then in terms of vitamin A itself, you do also get vitamin A in its sort of more, um, in, this, in this form of vitamin A rather than beta carotene in liver, because um, liver is a very, very rich source of vitamin A. But the difficulty or something to bear in mind is that liver, the high dose, the high levels of vitamin A in liver are actually very dangerous for pregnant women. And therefore, women who are pregnant should avoid eating liver, even though it is a good source of vitamin A, and that is important, because it can actually really damage the baby and can cause fetal defects so, and, and miscarriage as well. So liver during pregnancy is always something to avoid. Um, but yeah, so in terms of vitamin A and its, and its benefits, yes, it does help the eyes. It helps for immunity. It helps for skin. That's why when someone has acne and they're given Raccutan, that's essentially vitamin A. And that's one of the reasons why women would have to have a pregnancy test before having Raccutan because um, it's so dangerous to have during pregnancy. So it has many benefits from that point of view. But yes, and immunity is, is a big, big factor that we need to, to bear in mind in terms of its, its roles for sure. And what I found very interesting as well was your portions of vegetables. Half the plate should be vegetables. Now, I know in South Africa, we are meat and carbohydrate eaters. 
Uh, have you found that in the statistics? Is that... So um, definitely, I think that um, if we look at what is a normal plate in South Africa, it's more common for half the plate to be starch than half the plate to be vegetables. And I think that comes down to affordability, also <clears throat> comes down to better knowledge and education, as I mentioned earlier. But um, I think people just need to know better that to prioritize vegetables and how to prioritize it. And also that vegetables needn't be an afterthought, but rather can be a feature in itself that it can be almost the highlight of the meal or the focal point of the meal rather than like, oh, I guess I should have some vegetables. Okay, I'm just gonna like put some like, like over boiled broccoli on my plate. But it should be that really we embrace the vibrancy that vegetables add to meal, the color, the texture, etc. So yeah, that's how it, how it ideally should be. Um, broccoli, talking about broccoli. Yeah. The problem with broccoli is that smell. Yes. Um, I, I've got a grandchild and he yeah. he woke up one morning, he loves broccoli. He woke up one morning and, and, and I said, all right, what would you like for breakfast today? So this child says broccoli. I mean, I just <laughs> thought I can't bear it. So I said, no, 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 no. That's not going to happen in this house. <laughs> Look, the smell, it depends how you cook it as well. Hey? Um, if you roast it or you have it raw, you don't get as much of a smell. Mm, yes. But, you know, during this COVID times, they talk a lot about this vitamin D. Now, South Africa has sunshine. We're a country of sunshine. It's, we're so lucky. Yet they say that um, a vitamin D immunity is on the increase here. Just chat a little bit more about that. And why is vitamin D so important? So vitamin D is very, very important from the point of view of um, sort of overall health, but specifically and, and immunity as well. But even cancer prevention, allergy prevention, weight management indirectly, or lowering the risk of diseases like diabetes, um, just sort of overall um, health and bone health is a big one. So preventing osteoporosis um, and um, sort of improving bone health in children as well. So yes, we do have a lot of sunshine in South Africa, but how many of us spend 15 minutes outside a day with un unprotected sun exposure, so no sunscreen? Very few of us. So although we might have obviously sunlight filtering through our windows and that sort of thing, a lot of us have UV protection in our cars and on our car windows, and we don't actually have as much sun exposure as one would think. And in addition to that, the absorption will be affected by melanin in the skin. So the darker one's skin, the less vitamin D you actually are absorbing. And that's why I must say, when I test people's vitamin D levels, I would say majority of people have some level of vitamin D deficiency. Also, when one looks at the vitamin D um, levels recommendations, so the general recommendation depends on the lab. The one lab, so um, versus Ampath versus Lancet, because those are the most common ones that I deal with in Joburg. The one will say that your vitamin D levels should be above 20. The other one will say above 30. But either way, even if we're looking above 20, above 30, that's just to prevent osteoporosis. If we're looking at optimal health, it should ideally be above 40. So um, most people, I mean, I virtually never see someone who have a, has a vitamin D level that's high enough. So, mm. yeah. That's absolutely true. Now, I know with working with Danone a lot, their yeah. foods are fortified with zinc. Tell us about zinc, because they say at the moment, zinc is the big thing. Everyone's talking about yeah. zinc. Yes. So zinc helps from an immunity point of view in terms of improving immune function, um, improving uh, recovery from illness, but also improves wound healing as well. So it is so important to include. However, having said that, I have found some people have gone a bit crazy on zinc supplementation and having too much zinc is also not good because then it actually prevents iron and copper absorption. So you, that's what, come, what is important to bear in mind with all supplementation, whatever vitamins you're taking, you can't go, oh, well, I need to have vitamin D. Let me take 50,000 a day. Oh, I need more zinc. Let me have a whole bottle of zinc <laughs> tablets a day. You don't want to overdo it either mm -hmm. because when you push past that point of sort of the right amount of supplementation, you often do more harm than good. And it's not a case of that more is better at all. 
So just to bear that in mind as well. Okay, we've got another question here. Does eating more fruits on a daily basis have a, um, than a full meal has, have a negative impact on nutrition? So um, I, I think what the person's asking, and they're welcome to clarify, is that if you basically eat fruit throughout the day, as opposed to eating like your breakfast, lunch, dinner kind of thing, I assume. Yes. Um, so the thing is that, okay, so fruit has many benefits. <clears throat> high in vitamins and minerals and antioxidants, high in fiber, has fluid as well, so you get some fluid from that too. <clears throat> but um, it also is high in the fruit sugar, and you don't want to have excessive amounts of that. So what you want to do is definitely try to still have the um, sort of meal distribution where you're eating your meals and snacks throughout the day, because then you also are getting um, enough of the protein and the fats as well, which you won't get from fruit. And also, I think just sort of psychologically or mentally, it's important to define and have more structure to your day. So it's not just the whole day you're just eating fruit and you won't feel satisfied with that either. So I wouldn't recommend that necessarily. Okay, and then another question here. There's a lot of, of vegetarians and more and more people are, are going off meat. What are the benefits of meat that other vegetables or fruits can't give you? So in terms of red meat, um, or actually or your meat and chicken, you do certainly get iron from that. <clears throat> and you do definitely get um, B vitamins and um, you will get certain other um, fatty acids like CLA that people often take as a supplement, you do get from red meat. But certainly you don't have to have, have red meat to be healthy. Someone, and, and also, I mean, that also depends because a lot of people are going pescatarian as well and not having red meat and chicken, but they are having fish. So certainly you don't have to have meat and chicken to be healthy and to get the benefits you need. Fish itself has the essential fatty acids, the omega-3s, which you can get from plant sources, but aren't as readily available. So if someone wants to be fully vegetarian and let's assume that they are having milk and eggs, they can basically get the nutrients they need, but the iron is something that they need to be particularly focused on. And they need to make sure in general that they have enough of those animal proteins to get the protein that they need from the, so basically the eggs and the dairy. So I, I, don't, think, I don't think that one needs to eat meat or animal products in general to be healthy. Even if someone's fully vegan, it is possible. But certainly it takes a lot more work and a lot more thought to get the protein, the iron, the B vitamins, et cetera, that they would usually get very easily by being more carnivorous. Okay, now our next speaker is Joe from, he's asked a question here. What are your thoughts on youngsters drinking chocolate milk after their activity, uh, specifically in winter, in cold weather? So the temperature <clears throat> outside the climate won't make a huge difference to whether that would be a good option or not, because it would be fine as an option either way. There was some research that came out quite a while ago, I'd say about 10 years or maybe even more, that chocolate milk after a workout was as effective, if not even more effective in some cases than the conventional protein shakes and sports drinks. Um, so I don't have a problem with that at all. I don't think that's a bad idea, but a lot of it depends on the type of exercise that was done. So if, for example, it's something that's a very, very light workout and a very short workout or training session, or like say like a stretching session or something like that, then it's not necessary. If it's a very intense session, then the chocolate milk would have its place, but may not be sufficient on its own. So it's, it's very much depends on the activity, but I think for young kids, it works well, especially since, as I said earlier, I'm not keen on the idea of like an actual protein shake for children. So yeah, I mean, I think it can have its applications depending on the situation and depending on the sports and the session and the event that actually took place. Okay, and does diet and nutrition, are there specific foods that different, or even different sporting codes? Uh, does diet and nutrition specified for sporting codes? Because certain sports will require different demands. I think what they're trying to say here for different sports, are there different foods that are good for different sports? Well, it's not so much as different foods, but different balance of nutrients. So for example, I mean, and obviously a, a sport like 
weightlifting will have higher protein demands than say long distance running, which will have higher carbohydrate demands, but the overall calorie intake will also change depending on the sport. So yes, in terms of calorie or kilojoule intake, and in terms of bro balance of protein to carbs to fat, that will vary. In terms of specific foods, it's not like spinach is good for this sport, but broccoli is good for that one. So that won't necessarily change, but the actual macronutrients, protein, carbs, fat, calories, et cetera, will vary. You know, our company in June Communications, we work a lot with international teams. Uh, uh, they could be the national teams, teams coming in and out of South Africa and all that. Did you know a lot of them bring their own chefs with them because they oh. specifically want specific foods? You know, different countries eat, have a yeah, different of way of eating. So they all bring their own mm. chefs and everything. Mm. So yeah. it's very interesting to see that. Yes, well, that, that also comes down to what I was saying earlier, that with any meal, pre an event, but I suppose it applies to any point afterwards as well, that you want the meal to have a mental or an emotional edge as well kind of component. So if someone comes from a foreign country and they're eating foods that are local to wherever they're competing, and it's not food that they're used to or comfortable with or enjoy, then it's going to affect their performance directly or indirectly. So that makes sense. Mm. You know, the, I, had, I was told years ago, I had to go to the, an African Cup of Nations. It was for Coca-Cola that year. And they said to me, Cassie, uh, you're off to Mali. Now, first of all, I had to look on the map because, of course, I know Africa quite well now. But I had to look on, on the map to find out where Mali was. And I had to go there. But I went with Safa. And um, they made me, because I was going with Safa and a whole group, they made me go to a travel clinic and understand what to eat and all that type of thing. So first From a of food all, safety point of view. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so first of all, I had the, the inoculations they made me go through. Although you only have to do it for, I think it was for yellow fever, they made me be inoculated against everything. I had two mm. days of injections and on both arms. Wow. <laughs> and then, you know, they warned, you know, they told me, which I found was very, very interesting. They said every country has their own bacteria in the water and our bodies are made up with bacteria according to our country. So mm. if you mm. go to Mali, there they could eat, drink the water, but they yeah. won't get sick. But I will, but yes. I, because I don't have the bacteria, and so I will be sick. Yes. And vice versa. It doesn't yes. Yes. I mean, I could go to Italy and I could get mm. sick on the Italian water and vice versa. Yes. It doesn't mean to say yes. that it's bad. It means yes. our bodies yes. do not have that bacteria to be yes. able to take Definitely. it. Definitely. Yeah, no. That definitely is the case, completely. But that's true. There'll be such a variety in our gut flora, depending on where we are in the world, for sure. And, and depending on what food we eat. And did you know that SAA pilots, they tell all their pilots, when you get to a new country, the first thing you need to do is have a yogurt because the yogurt is giving you that country's bacteria into your system. And it will help that's you while in that yeah. state. I guess it's assuming that that yogurt is locally made. That's why I always yeah. don't understand why people need to take probiotics from other countries. Like people will often take, oh no, I take this probiotic, it's imported, so it's a better option. And yeah, but it's not really specific to what's better for, for our South African population, so probably not such a good option. Yes. You know, we've gone over the time. I just want to make one comment before we, we, mm -hmm. we end off. And that is just an observation. You were talking earlier about stunted growth in South Africa. Now, I've been working with Danon for many, many years, and every year we take a team over to the, the world finals. And <clears throat> I've traveled around with our team, and we take the South African team every single year. And unfortunately, it's getting worse. They're all under 12. You get all the other countries, and I promise you, the South African kids are a good... 60 centimeters shorter than their, their, um, 
European or American or anywhere else in the world. It is, mm. it, it's a problem here. Yeah, and it's, it's very sad if you consider that, like, um, I remember I saw once like an antique coat of armor um, in London and the people there were so small, like the an adult was small. They were very short because the nutrition was poor then and has improved. And we're going sort of the other direction in South Africa, which is very, very sad. You know, the one year, um, Haiti, it was just after that huge um, earthquake they had. Haiti was one of the teams that came to the Dunon Nations Cup. Now, South Africa is much better than them. Those little kids looked eight, nine. They were 12, sorry, six, seven. Do you know that they were being carried around? It, 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 was, it was so sad. It was very sad. Wow. Awful. So, you know That's what, okay. Lila, you've been absolutely amazing, and we really thank you so much, and you're so passionate about your topic. So have an excellent weekend. And I'd just like thank to you. thank all my Danon people, Lea, Leanne Kayser, thank you very much for arranging this for you. So have a great weekend. And I would like to introduce thank my so next. Thank guest. you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.